We are in the heat of the Millville Days celebration. What an awesome time to be here in Millville. I stumbled in here last night to do a show after drinking some good beer from the uh, Double L on the street. They have a cool little mug or a, a glass you could take with you and walk up and down Grant Avenue. And it's awesome. I live there. I live on Grant. So much fun. You have to come check it out right here in Millville on Grant Avenue. Lots of fun all weekend. You are listening to The River's Edge, home of the smartest fan base in radio. Huge crowd this past council meeting at the Millville Borough meeting to come out and support local music and local beer. It was awesome. So much fun. Such a great attendance. So many amazing stories from people who literally moved to Millville two weeks ago to long life residence and uh, all sorts of good stuff. All we needed was one guy kneeling during the Pledge of Allegiance and we would have made the Tribune review. That's it. I am Brian Crawford. You are listening to the River's Edge Radio Network. I am Pittsburgh's Moral Compass. I am the master of the Millville Shore. You are listening to RiversEdgePGH.com, powered by NGL Web Tech. Honest, practical, and affordable. Go to NGLWebTech.com for all of your web servicing needs. You are the smartest audience in radio. You listen to this program. That should be testimony enough, but you came out when called upon. You came out and you showed up in numbers and you made a difference. Last night I was walking around Millville for Millville days before I came in here for my guest appearance on Football in High Heels and I ran into a council member and he specifically said that what we did that night, what you did by coming out and supporting local music, supporting local business owners and great beer and everything else we have here in Millville, he said that we made a difference. So congratulations. It was really just an awesome thing to see. It was wonderful. And the cool thing about the River's Edge and one of the things that I take pride in and I think will be very prevalent in our future as we grow is our numbers as they grow each month and they are growing again this month. You keep tuning in, you keep spreading the word and that's wonderful. As we grow, we're growing in a way that's very organic and it's a conscious decision that you make when you tune into riversedgepgh.com. You can't click seek on the radio. You can't just turn on the car and it pops on automatically. No, you have to go type in the website or you have to open up the tune in radio app. You're not just accidentally stumbling upon us, so you're not passively listening to this program or passively listening to the 24 hours of local music we have amongst our talk programs. No, you have made a decision to listen to us, and you made a decision to show up at the Millville Borough meeting, and I am very, very thankful for that. If you want to get involved in the show, our number is 412-407-2PGH. That's 412 412- 407-2744 or you can hit me up on Twitter at RiverTalkPGH and uh, I'm thrilled to have with me the one of the, the main venues, we have the owner of one of the main venues that was a hot topic of conversation apparently for uh, several weeks Mike uh, Speranzo and I have him right across the table from me how are you doing today? I'm doing great, how about yourself? I'm doing well, thank you uh, talk about the, the meeting and your reaction to what you saw at that meeting, because I'll be honest, I was the first one to speak at that meeting, and I didn't know if all of those people were with me or against me, and I'm like, I could be stepping into a riot here, I don't know. Yeah, I think Liz and I felt the same thing. We came in, uh, we, were, we were told to do it. Normally, I don't go to them because of uh, my fear of just getting lambasted by people that, that are unsatisfied with our presence here in the borough. Not that it's prevalent. I think I'm more um, paranoid than mm-hmm. I need to be just because I've been here for the 20 years and we've had to grassroots it and transition into into an environment where we are a little bit more stable. And, uh, you know, during that transition, it became very, uh, very difficult for us to, uh, to feel, I, at least me, feel comfortable when I knew that so many of my fellow neighbors were upset about the parking or about the kids and you know, I didn't want to make excuses, so I would, I would avoid it just just out of my nature, just to not go for the conflict. So sure. when I was asked by uh, by one of the councilmen to show up, uh, 
Liz and I were, were kind of antsy, but we felt like we were going to go into a positive thing. And when we saw so many people, I, my, my hands were sweating. I was like, oh my gosh, what are we, what are we in for? And then as it, as it sort of transpired, uh, listening to everyone talk, when I, by the time I stood up, I was an emotional mess. I, I cried <laughs> like a little baby because, you know, to get positive reaffirmation after a lot of, you know, 20 years worth of hard work and, and you, know, you know, you go against the wind. And then eventually you get you know, some kind of, you know, praise for what you've been doing, not looking for it. It's, it's an overwhelming situation. So for me, it was probably one of the, the most satisfying experiences that I've had, you know, in, in that form for sure. And, and, you know, I very rarely get into a position where people are like, hey, great job. You know, I love showing off smalls and I love being sure. a part of it, but I don't actually go out, and, you know, look for the pat on the back or ask for the reaffirmation. So it's weird, weird to just receive it. I've heard uh, a rumor that some of these residents have manufactured false complaints to the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement. Is there any validity to that? No, I've never had any issue like that. Um, PLCB has been great with us. Their, their major concern is just making sure that, that we're compliant to their, uh, their, their noise leakage clause, which is you know how, how much sound leaks out of the venue at, at, uh, at X amount of decibels at X amount of feet. And they've come out twice in, in the time that we've worked with them. So I think they've been great. They've come out and they've talked to us about our over-under protocols because we re very rarely mix the room. We like to separate the room for, you know, to give parents the state of mind, peace of mind that know that we're looking out for their kids. But at the same time, we want to allow it, you know, the drinkers to have a good time also. So, um, no, there's no validity to that. We've never received any hassle from anybody on that front. You know, not at all. Great. Uh the reaction of the crowd w was awesome, and I, what I thought was really interesting was there was this one lady who spoke, and she flat out said she doesn't like the music that you play. Mm -hmm. She said she doesn't like the beer at Grist House, but she was there to support both venues because she understood the value that both establishments have on the community. Do you think we need people like that in order to continue to, to grow this community, people who are open-minded enough to think beyond – their personal interests and think about the community, uh, the greater good of the community at large? Yeah, I, I think so. I think any community needs that. You know, when, when you're looking at the, the, uh, the educated perspective of a community, a lot of times it is mired in an older perspective. And that's not a bad perspective. That brings a lot of wisdom, patience, and, 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 and thought on being careful. But at the same time, you need youth energy to sort of shake it up and to push it a little bit more forward to get a, a lifeline and, and, you know, a desire in the, in the community to, to grow past what its aging community is. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult dynamic, and a lot of times um, older people are, are not comfortable with blue-haired Mohawk people coming through, you know, in this community, they've never seen anything like that, you know, or or the Juggalos or whoever it might be, because we're a, we're a sh open showcase venue. We don't discriminate against the genre or anything. So she probably loves some of the music that comes to small. She just only understands it as what she has seen that she doesn't like. Sure. Um, so I, I look at that. And I'm like, well, you would have loved Nora Jones. Oh. Uh -huh. You know, when Nora Jones was there, that would have been a great show for you to see. But you know, I understand why Guar isn't your taste. You know, but sure. we're not there to discriminate that. And I think you know, the more communities have youth integrating into the community, that more healthy the community could be. So I feel like that's what Millville is uh, is doing now, is transitioning into a, a community where the youth are getting involved in the community. They're they're starting to believe that there's value in a grassroots blue collar neighborhood like Millvale, and, they, and that's where they want to be. They don't want to be in a in a club oriented, you know, nature where you're at the south side where it's a lot of bars and there's a club mentality. They'd rather be around, you know, blue collar music, blue collar beers, blue collar people. Talk about the business because one thing that always surprised me about Mr. Smalls, and I don't think that people realize this at all, that it is a family business. It's a like it's a small family business. Whenever you go to Smalls, it's it's just it's it's well put together. You guys have, have done a great job with the venue. So when you go in there, you think that it's uh, at least my opinion. I go in there and I see this like how well put together it is, how everything is run. I, th I think that it's like this major company that's like worldwide, and this is like one of their spots. But really, it's a family business, and a lot of family members uh, work at Smalls. Correct? Yeah, I mean, all all the you know, my niece works there. My my nephew, who is a professional skateboarder, he is our partner. My wife and I, we we pretty much do the the nuts and bolts. My you know, my my niece Sean, and she she manages the venue and does all the special events coordination. So it's very very small on that end. I mean, we've just been blessed with. 
the support of, of the Pittsburgh, the greater Pittsburgh community, the tri-state community for the shows, and that's given us the opportunity to, to use some of that revenue to, to build up the infrastructure, to get it to look like what you had said, where it's, uh, you know, it seems like it's bigger than it is, but quite honestly, it's three or four of us that are really just grinding it out. There's a great team of people that work the shows, but uh, we're talking about the day-to-day behind-the-scenes sure. action. You know, I don't mean to, you know, I'm not trying to demote any of the value of any of our employees, that's for sure. But, you know, when, when it comes to the, the real struggle, there's probably a team of two or three of us that, that are building the facility. Um, I've built the facility since, you know, it's been 20 years, um, you know, just one screw at a time. You know, that's pretty much, uh, oh, we have a dollar, let's reinvest it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, Liz and I have never been gotten paid. We don't make any money. For 20 years I've worked, I've never received a paycheck. Um, any extra capital that we make, we put right back into the facility. That's where you guys have noticed the improvements and the growth. And that's a conscious effort. You know, it's, I'm not looking to, to take out of smalls. I'm looking to have the life that I want. I, I do have to to com- have one complaint. Yes, and uh, it, it's it's kind of a petty complaint, but uh, I guess I'm kind of like coming from the perspective of the the parking lot people here. But you guys have done some great remodeling with the balcony. But that was my area. I went up the balcony, up the creaky steps, and there was always just like one video camera up there taping that's the where show. You could, that's where you could hide. And I could hide <laughs> up there and I could watch the show from a bird's eye view and yeah. and now there's other people up there and I can't just be well, up there by myself. You know, all good things are meant to share and, you know, so you just have to deal with that. But, <laughs> you know, if you if you, if you you go to the show early, if you uh, go online early enough, you can get a place at the balcony and see it yourself. It's a really great experience. It's, it's, yeah, it's beautiful up there. You yeah, it's have... made a big difference in the way the way people that want to not be in the crowd, older people that, that want that kind of intimate experience can get it. And then, you know, there's people that love both. They, they rent the balcony out, and then by the time the headliner's on, they're, they're down there kicking it with everyone else. And then they, you know, so. I, there is something to be said about a balcony as well, because one of my biggest complaints with the Ultra Bar closing is that they were one of, of only a, a few venues that have that balcony area yeah, where, you can, yeah, where you can watch down. Because I'm somebody, I, I love local music, I love watching, but I'm not a mosher. I like to stand up at a distance and watch. Yeah, I'm a voyeur also when it comes to that kind of thing. I'm... I'm, I'm community i'm i guess uh crowd shy you mm-hmm. know like when i get into a crowd i get a kind of you know antsy but uh the balcony is great for that and i think the altar bar was great the graffiti used to have a really great balcony a long time ago they were the one of the first showcase venues in pittsburgh that was doing the type of thing that we're doing now mm-hmm. so they were the, sort of the grandfather of that kind of uh that kind of uh venue venue perspective where you let anybody in you, you know you have nirvana one week and you have hootie and the blowfish the other I yeah mean, so <laughs> different time now, you talked at the council meeting about the struggles that you guys have had in building the place and keeping it together. I'm wondering if you could share some of those struggles with us here on the uh, the River's Edge because I'm curious. It, it's interesting to see the journey of, of how people are able to, to move their product and continue to grow. I know with us, and I've spoke about this on this program many of times, we literally started in a closet in an attic and we've continued to move forward, and, and it's interesting to hear those stories. I'm wondering if you could share that with us. Sure. Uh, I think the 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 best thing about Smalls to me is the fact that it was an organically grown, you know, endeavor. Uh, we were eventually we were started out thinking we were a recording studio really at 139 Grand Avenue in Millville. We started in '97, mm-hmm. and we were there for four years. And unfortunately, the roof collapsed due to uh, a, a leak. And it put us in a position where we needed to find a new place. And we uh, we had heard from the uh, the mayor's brother that the that the St. Anne's Church was just acquired by the borough from from the diocese, and we should contact them. And when we did so, we uh, we struck a deal with them that was you know they were forward thinking. The borough at that time was really looking to try to help do what we're accomplishing now in Millvale. They were thinking about that 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we struck the deal to build our recording studio in the St. Anne's Church. And right away, the, the turbulence happened because that's right when Pro Tools sort of came into the recording industry okay. and, and degraded the value of an hour for a recording studio. It went from being a, a $50 or a $75 an hour trade to now $30. Okay. So we couldn't afford the bank loan that we, we expected to get because the recording industry hourly rate dropped. So we instantly had to reshift our, our focus on the room. And Liz and I thought it was the, the right fit to make a concert venue. So during that process, we had to, uh, you know, 
call a lot of audibles, work with a lot of people and do what we could to survive. And, and that struggle put us, you know, immensely behind the eight ball to the point where we were in foreclosure with PNC Bank. You know, they were going to come down on us. They did a long forbearance period with us to, to make sure that they weren't killing it because PNC was very aware that if they killed Smalls, they would be killing a part of the, the, the Pittsburgh music fa fabric at that point. Mm -hmm. we, you know, at that point, we were, we were seven, eight, ten years into the, you know, 11 years into the, the, the build of what Smalls is. And we, at that point, we had a lot of momentum, but it wasn't cash flush. You know, it wasn't making enough money to pay the, the loans that we had to, you know, pay. So we were fortunate enough to, uh, to get with a, a partner who was able to resolve the issues with PNC. And uh, Liz and I, we, we sold, we're selling our house and that house is going to buy us into that partnership. And, you know, so it's a really, really, really great relationship and I'm excited about it. But the journey has been long and, and hard and it's based on perseverance. I mean, you really, when you have a passion, like you said, you're in the closet and you're like, I'm gonna, I see yeah. the growth of this and I believe, I believe it will grow. I, I, I think that, you know, continuing at it and seeing it past its blind spot, you know, when you're, when you're in the most dark times about your, your vision, about what you want and what you're trying to achieve, getting past that is so unbelievably rewarding. How many 60 hour days have you experienced trying to build the facility? Well, I, I, I work pretty <laughs> much nonstop. So, I mean, you know, I, I do, I do a lot of, you know, 60 hour weeks, 80 hour weeks constantly. I mean like 60 hours without sleeping. That was in the old days. I used to. Yeah, do a yeah, I assumed. Yeah, I used to do it constantly. Could do I do two nights in a row, like, and then sleep for you know a long afternoon and do it over and over again because mm -hmm. I was the guy that was doing all the building and leading up to the show. So I would do all this work and then I'd put the last screw in and the doors would be open. I'd go, I'm going to bed and I'd leave and go sleep because I'd be so <laughs> tired because I'd been working for three days prior to that just to get this done or that done, you know, or whatever we could do to make the place better. Yeah, I, I completely can relate to that. I've, I've done that numerous times myself. So uh, you are also a musician. Uh, your wife, Liz Berlin, obviously with, with Rusted Root, and, and right. she's in uh, another band as well. Uh, is that how you guys met? Did you guys meet through music? Yeah, actually, uh, I was in a band in, out, out of the blue in State College, which was a Graffiti Pittsburgh Rock Challenge winner. Um, we got to know each other through that. Uh, right when I first saw her, I knew that, you know, it's this cliche story. I was like, that's the girl I'm going to marry. And my friend Frank was like, no, you're crazy. That's the girl that everybody's trying to hook up with. She's in Rusted Root. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So eventually uh, we got to know each other and hang out. And, you know, I was, a, I was a, a, a skateboarder. I was a pro skateboarder and I was at Woodward. And, you know, we, we got the news that she was pregnant, you know, and I stopped, I quit Woodward and, and stopped skating professionally and traveled with her uh, for three and a half years while, she, you know, she was able to you know, have Jordan and we were able to start our family together on the road. And then at that point, I got tired of that and came to Millville and started Smalls. That's awesome. Uh, tell me about your band, too, uh, because you are in a, in a band as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was more of a when, – when all that was going down, I, I had to stop playing music and travel with Liz to take care of her. So there wasn't mm. a lot of music that I could do. You know, I was sort of – I was relegated – and this is not a, derog a negative term, but I was sort of like the baby tech. Sure, I was yeah. the guy that was taking care of the baby, so there wasn't a lot of music in my life. So – Liz, being conscientious of, of what I had sacrificed, decided to, to, to prod me to start buying some recording gear. And over that process, I, I started recording a lot of music just by myself. Mm -hmm. And after years and years, she started listening to it, and my friends started listening to it, and they were like, let's play this music, and sort of, sort of evolved into what is The Drowning Clowns, which was more of a therapeutic project for me to make me feel like I wasn't giving up what I really loved, because I love music, but... Sometimes, as you know, when, when you're trying to do something, you have to give up what you love for a little bit to achieve what you need to achieve. Sure. And that sacrifice is, is something that only resonates to that person. It's, it's a very personal loss, you know, because you can't be upset about it. There's so much I've gained in that loss. But ultimately, you know, you, you, you sit at home at night and go, oh, man, I could have, you know. And so it was nice to be able to fulfill that and have all my friends back me on it. You know, especially because I was a bass player prior to that, and now I'm like sort of singing. Well, if you call it singing and playing guitar, mm -hmm. and it's sort of you know an interesting an interesting change because it's it's you know more of a metamorphosis than it is a you know a, a natural trajectory. I wasn't ready. I wasn't picked up. I didn't pick up the guitar and say this is my instrument. Sure. You know, I listened to Jane's Addiction and other bands like that where the bass players had a, a predominant role in the music, and that inspired me to to that instrument in particular. I didn't want to play any other instrument. You know, so so getting into guitar and getting shifting and being um, motivated by my friends to do something that was out of my comfort zone was probably the best thing I could have done musically for myself. Yeah, that's an awesome story. And uh, 
the place keeps growing, and uh, you just just added the fun house, right? And that's awesome. I, I know you have some other things in the works, but that really, to me, has become a very special place for me. And uh, a funny story you might enjoy. We were at the fun house the one day, and this is just the the impact that smalls can have on someone. We're at the fun house, and I'm there listening to to wonderful music. It's always some of the best music you'll find in the city. And I'm there, and I'm having some some drinks, and the place closes down, and I'm a regular there, so I'm there drinking after everyone else is gone, and <laughs> which happens, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Dylan's like, you know, you guys got to go. It's time to leave. So uh, the bartender, so Jeremy's like, let's go get one more drink at Hambones. They got last call. So we, I said, sure. If somebody else, you know, I want somebody else to drive me. I didn't feel like driving, so we drove up to Hambones, and we're getting a, a drink, and then we run into Ian Insect. And we're like, we're not done yet. It's it's 2 a.m. So we ended up sleeping on the str on some stranger's roof that's connected to his porch. So uh, thanks to <laughs> the funhouse at Mr. Small's, I have now slept on some stranger's roof. Well, I'm glad that we could help you on your, your night of debauchery, I guess. I don't know how, <laughs> how that goes. But the funhouse is a really the, – probably the best thing that – you know, the, I love the venue and it's it's a part of me and, and I love it. But there's a sense of uh, – the truth is, is you can't experience how great the venue is unless you're willing to pay a ticket price that sometimes is more than you want to pay or a band you don't want to see. So mm -hmm. you're not going to have that experience with it. And that's not a negative thing about it, but, you know, it's, it's a showcase venue made for national profile. You know, it's 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 a big time uh, interaction between the artist who is a national caliber artist most of the time or regional and their fan base. It's made specifically for that marriage. Um it doesn't work as well when you talk about uh, what's going on with the local base because you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with a, a, an empty room sometimes, mm -hmm. and it makes a band feel intimidated. I've been on that stage when it's been empty; it's intimidating. Sure, um, it's you know there, there's a lot of different struggles with the room that size when it comes to connecting to its local base. So the fun house was a happy accident. That space was half created in two different sides, and there was a thing in the middle, and we were able to figure out how to remove the thing in the middle that made the space what it is. Um, but it was there for 19 years, and I was staring at it, never knew it existed. And then one day it, it came on to me where we could do it. And when I realized what we had, it was it was a very fulfilling thing because now I have an a, a way to, to access and be a part of my local community where I, when you were in the closet, you were you were away from everybody. You were sure. working on your thing and you lost all your friends. You know, it's, it's there was a transition issue where I had the same problem. All my friends were like, we're going on with our lives. And I'm like, well, I've got the hammer in my hand if you want to visit, you know. But now with the fun house, I can reconnect with those friends and make new ones that are in the community. And that's really where what's most important to Liz and I is to be a member of our community, to be an active musician for no reason other than to be a part of our community. You know, not to be a big star, not to be known or not to have a hit record or people love the music, just to be able to play the open mic on Monday for my friends who are other musicians and then pat me on the back and go, man, that was great. Or, you know, f just for us, I think there's nothing more fulfilling. So the fun house really, really rounds that out for, for Liz and I. And you guys show up at the fun house too. I've, I know I've seen Liz pr perform several times. Well, we live upstairs. Okay. So I live on the third floor of the schoolhouse. So I just walk down two flights and That's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm in the fun house. <laughs> so it's, it, it's really, it's, it's an inter interesting dynamic because you know, it's, you, I can't rest on that excuse where I'm not going to go out because I don't want to go out. I'm like, I got to get off the couch. Yeah, there's no, there's literally steps. no excuse. It, it's kind of like coming to the studio. I live on Grant Avenue. The studio is here. So yeah. even though, I mean, you have less of an excuse than I do, but, <laughs> but even that is, you know, it, it's a half a minute walk right. for me to get here. So, yeah. And I mean, you know, and, and it, and it, and it challenges my, my, uh, my apathy. I think it's a great thing sure. for me as a, as a person, because I'm, um, as if, you know, I, I'm, I'm an isolationist. I like to be, I'm afraid of, 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 of big situations internally i can deal with them and i'll step up that's not a problem but it's there's always an anxiety that i always have to overcome when it comes to like going into crowds or even this you know or or the the council meeting just mm -hmm. just it's just always an odd position because for the last 20 years i've been behind a door with a hammer in my hand not you know it's it's created a very uh i guess messed up psyche in my head well, it's interesting because this has actually had the complete opposite effect on me being in this station because with radio, you have to be in people's faces all the time, right? All the time. So I just the reason why I'm a lot of times without sleep is I'm here doing shows, then I got to do the the post production, but then I got to make sure I get to all these open mics, which I love doing because it, it, you know I'm there with my friends. But 
you know, you still have to make sure you're there and people know you and right. see you and get involved with live broadcasts and then yeah. little I didn't have mini... to deal with that at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and I was somebody who was, I, I'm the type of person to get upset if I'm not going out anyways. I, I kill myself and punish myself if I'm not out because I'm thinking, oh, I'm, you know, wasting my time. So this actually is in some ways feeding that maybe uh, maybe in an unhealthy way because I'm constantly constantly going out without without stopping so but it's that's what you do to get things rolling and keep things going yeah and w when I talk about you know it I'm always pointing out the 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 things that I don't like about me or the situation or in the council meeting when when that that lady had said well I don't even know what the negative things are and the first thing I could think of was, well, I wanted to tell her what they were. I wanted everyone in that room to know that I, you know, the first thing I said were all the negative things and our impact on our community. You know, I don't, I, you know, I'm always reevaluating where I'm at based on my, my weaknesses, not necessarily my strengths, because I think there's always room for me to be better or to be, you know, or the smalls could be better or, you know, my, the way I treat my family, my son, my nephews, my niece, mm -hmm. I'm always looking to try to, uh, to try to reevaluate who I am. And, and, and in doing so, sometimes, you know, I might say things that seem deprecating. And it, I don't really, you know, I don't really think that. It's just a way for me to, you know, look at my, my nature and my behavior. So, like, I am an isolationist. You know, I, I will run away from, from social situations because it's more comfortable being around two people than it is ten for someone like me. That's mm -hmm. not a great thing. That's not a bad thing. But I think ultimately... Um, I have to acknowledge that just like I did, did the things that are wrong with smalls or stuff like that. And I'm sure, you know, as well, a business person, you do the same. Yeah. Well, honestly, I think honesty is the best policy and maybe this makes me a bad salesperson, but we were interviewing a, a lady for a show who wants to come on the network and I was flat out honest. I said, I, I think this network, to be honest, is, is the most exciting network in Pittsburgh as far as online media goes. People want to become a part of this network. But I said, I think Epicast is probably the most hip or the coolest mm -hmm. network. And it wasn't taking away from our network, but I'm just being honest. Right. I think they kind of have that underground feel. We have more of like an exciting new, uh, we're the new thing. Nobody's done what we have done before. So I, but I'd rather be honest than, you know, say like, oh, we're the, you know, we, no, we're you, the you hippest. You have and, to be. Yeah. I think you really have to be. And I think bands need to be. I think uh, people need to be. I think their business owners need to be. You have to look at what you're not providing and who you're not to really understand who you can be. And that doesn't mean you do that to a detriment to your sure. psyche. You know, you don't beat yourself up over over what you're not. You just look at it honestly, like you said, and and you you ch you change course. You know, you you make the proper adjustments because really. It's it, we're all surfing out here, you know. We all we don't know. None of us really know, you know, as business owners or dreamers or musicians or or people. We don't, you know. We're trying to do the best to react properly to the people that are around us. And and you know, I know this is sort of outside of the box, but for me, this this is the philosophy that created Smalls. It was mm -hmm. based on what we weren't one day at a time. It was never. There was never the bank loan. There was never that mo magic moment where I was House sure. of Blues and there was like seven million dollars <laughs> in a in a in a coffer and I could I could make the proper adjustments with the building, which is you know an 18th century church, which at, in itself was a nightmare to just deal with sure. how to how to bend that into a place where you can have you know modern rock shows, you know with the scrutiny of touring artists that sometimes are are not compatible with the blue collar experience. They don't you know some of them in the beginning didn't want that. I had an ex I had I said a story the other day. We lost so much money on this this rat band. It was like not really rat. It was like the brother of the guy that was in rat, and we thought it would do well in the community, and it was a misstep. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was right when we were starting, and um, I like gave them the five grand and their guarantee, and they take the money, and as they leave, they go, you know, you guys really need a new sign. <laughs> but what they didn't know is that five grand was my deposit for the sign I was sure. going to play the next day, and I was just like, well, there you go. So I mean, we had to, you know figure out how to get back and we still haven't gotten that sign. <laughs> well, that's the one nice, yeah. <laughs> but that's the nice thing is you're always looking to, to move forward and try new things. And uh, right now we're on video and I, when I started this as an example, I was absolutely opposed to video. I said, absolutely not. Yeah. I just, I, I am a traditional radio guy mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, radio is a theater of the mind. And then I would see shows on television where they would broadcast a uh, in video a radio show and i thought this is the dumbest thing in the world who would ever want to watch this and it was just a camera that o had an overview of the studio so i was detrimentally opposed to mm. video and then i saw 
what Michael Sorg was doing with Sorgatron Media, and he does video, and he does it uh, with, with little cameras like we have here, and it's a close-up. You can see the person's face. You can put their information yeah, so it's at the bottom. Room. It's just a, it's in a giant room. It, versus a giant yeah. room, yeah. It's, it's, it's more personal, and it almost looked like a CNN interview, and I thought, man, I got to have this. So uh, I think having that open mind will, will help the venue to grow. I know it's helped this station to grow a lot. Yeah. And uh, what, what are some of the troubles that you are facing currently? Right now, currently? Um, understanding how to put growth into perspective, uh, you know, how to grow not too fast, mm -hmm. how to grow within, within, within what you're trying to do, not let your, your, your dreams and your ambitions drive the mission of the business as much. Because at this point, um, every move has, has an implication that could affect others. Unintended consequences are more valid now than they were when we were first starting because we needed to, you know, band-aid and patch so many things up. So right now we're just trying to make the the right steps. I think the biggest the biggest struggle that we have is is really just trying to figure out how to resolve some of the issues for the community, looking at parking result resolutions and and looking how to better bridge our relationship with the community, offering them entertainment that is cheap or free, so they can just come up and understand what is what we're trying to create there, what our culture is, and and who we are as a people. As I said, at forty dollar ticket or thirty dollar ticket or even twenty five dollar ticket. A lot of the Millvalians don't know the bands. These are up-and-coming bands that are not in that now. But if they could realize that they could uh, come up to the Funhouse for free and see just local music and get sure. to know, you know, m you know, a wide variety of them from, from, you know, you look at Clinton from Common Heart, who's, who's got a buzz going on right now. Thank God that they do because they're a great band and he's a great performer and he deserves it. But he, he was a member of the Acoustic Cafe regulars every Monday at, at Club Cafe before I moved to the Funhouse all the time. Morgan, the same thing. Jeremy, there's just so many really great local musicians that that are cutting their teeth. And I believe that the Millvillians, Shalerins, Etnans, you know, will love the entertainment that's there. We just have to figure out how to bridge it without blowing tons of money because with local music, sure. there's, there's not the economy tied to it where there's not this deal. Where yeah. in, the, in the deal, there's you know, $500 or $1,000 for, for advertising. It doesn't work that way with, with a local show. Well, I think you're doing a great job with uh, Facebook and social media. I know that's helped us a lot because we're in a similar position where we're at a, a crossroads in, in the River's Edge where we're transitioning to a, a profitable company at this point it's well, congratulations like you, that's great thank you yeah we're, we're at a point where we could start selling advertising and things like that so we're moving in that direction but until uh that point right now i'm you know myself and my business partners are funding everything so it, it's yeah, i no, understand <laughs> yeah so i understand exactly where you're coming from but, but social media and word of mouth is how you know we've grown from you know a podcast to uh, 24 hours to 500 listeners a month to now thousands and that's just been through social media and yeah. just getting the word out there and constantly being in people's faces. Like I said, that, that's the one thing that's really helped us grow is just that constant uh, of this constant social media blitz where we're just on all the time. And we'll take like today's show, we'll take clips. Well, maybe not this show because it's we're having a longer interview, but typically we have more Understood. clips and then we'll push that out there. Or I'll do like something like the other day I, I spoke with a gentleman, Will Jurgens at Hambones, and he was at – the club cafe he was at smalls at the fun house and then he was at Hambones for three different open mics so we were able to have a discussion with him as somebody who was new to the pittsburgh open mic scene so what was what, his what was his what was his thoughts uh well he he liked all three venues he really loves the culture that exists here at the open mic scene and how friendly and accepting and in pittsburgh. opening yeah in pittsburgh yeah it's really great i love how they play with each other and they enjoy uh, each other's company and there's not a a, a overwhelming competition going on of course everyone wants to be successful but they're not going to do it at the demise of anyone else that to their friendship you know they're not going to lose friendship over over some kind of pittsburgh success which i really love about our culture and our scene is yeah. that we we put it in perspective a lot of the musicians really put it in perspective that they understand at this point what's really at stake you know and everybody wants to break out but everybody realizes that there's nowhere to break out to the music industry isn't as equipped as it used to be to to create that overnight success or to to give someone that kind of windfall as a musician it just doesn't work that way anymore so we you know i feel like the the best thing that they do and what i love about what they do is they really care about entertaining for each other yeah i, I it it is a wonderful culture and i i know myself it, it, i'm in a weird position where i you know, I played music in high school, but I'm not really, I wouldn't consider myself a musician. I'm a talker. I, I, you know, I bullshit on the, on the internet. That's <laughs> what I do. 
and I create the station, and being that I'm not exactly in the same mold as these people, they still have opened me with uh, open, their, you know, open arms. They've welcomed welcomed me in, and due to that culture and that acceptance and that friendliness, I, you know, we've been able to do live broadcasts at different places. We actually did a, uh, a audio live broadcast at the Funhouse once. Awesome for uh, yeah for Spencer Allen Patrick's band uh, Brash Teeth. So uh, that's opened a lot of doors for us, and I feel like in other places maybe those doors wouldn't be as widely opened because people are, I think, a little more uh, inclusive and not as willing to, to work with other people in other cities. And that's things that, that's something I've heard, too, from other musicians. Oh, yeah, it's traveled. something I've witnessed. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen it in communities. You know, I've, I've seen it. It's interesting, uh, as Jesse, Jesse Prentice said, uh, it's, 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 it is a click, but it's the easiest click you'll ever get into. Yeah. You know, it's, it, there, there is a, a group of people, but it's so welcoming. And, and no one is looking to, to like I said, to down anyone else for their art. A lot of artists come to the, the Fun House for the Acoustic Cafe open stage. And, and you know, I'm sure they're paranoid. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're scared because of the, it's sort of like walking into a music store, you know, or a vinyl store and getting that, you know, that, that vibe. Like there's some kind of like expertise that you don't know and, and they know and they're in the know and you don't and you feel kind of awkward. And I, I feel like that, you know, I'm sure a lot of people feel that way about open stages, but the Acoustic Cafe open stage in particular, and probably Hand Bones, and, and now the, the monthly at Club Cafe and the things that are going on um, are very inclusive. And I and I encourage any young musician that wants to find a culture or a place for their songs to, to come out and engage their community because they're going to be surprised how welcoming it is and how, and how proud people are when they see other people get on stage. It really, you know, when they see young people the first time, they, they, they pay attention and they give them a lot of love and support because everyone knows that, you know, the high tides, you know. If we all come up, we all come up together. If we bring it together, we all bring it together. And, you know, that's the, there's nothing greater for a community than that, that experience. We're going to close with looking towards the future. Okay. Where is Smalls headed in 2017 as the year is, is ending? Well, I think what we're going to try to do is continue to refine what we've created in the Funhouse and, and tighten up our systems and, and just be better at what we do, give better customer service and give better band service the best we can. Um, I think we have uh, the, the opportunity to grow and we were lucky enough to purchase the church across the street. The United Methodists were very kind to us and 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 so we have that building and it's it's right now a production facility but in the future we're hoping to turn it into a a, a restaurant performance theater that has a coffee shop that is made for the community right there across the across the street from Smalls and so the the big dream is that and when when that gets done I don't know because you know it's it's a matter of you know we don't have a lot of money we're doing it one one dime at a time. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know when that development can get done, but th those are the dreams. That's what's out there for us right now. I'm very excited about that. And this goes back to one of my, uh, crazy nights at smalls. I was there. I met you. It was the first time I met you actually in the back room and yeah. I, you got, you took us over. We got to see the place and being able to experience it myself. I can kind of see, I think what your vision is for that place. And I think it's going to be just an unbelievable venue. Yeah. I think that, a. a it's not necessarily a dinner theater as much as you would have seen in the 50s or, you know, that, that kind of dinner theater mentality. It's really, if you're going to go to Subway or if you're going to go to any other place for food, you could go and watch an acoustic artist at the same time. And mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a theater as much as while you're eating, you might as well watch great local live music. You know, you might while you're drinking a coffee, you might as well go in and see it. It should be there. And we're going to try to respect the building as much as possible. It's really important to Liz and I to to you know the architecture in that building the stained glass in that building is all intact and we're not going to we're not going to take it out of there for fears of hurting someone that is offended by a god image mm -hmm. you know it, it it is it is an old church it's an important part of its history it's an important part of our history and if we strip it from everything that we have for fear of uh, offending people then we've lost a big part of ourselves because that institution all institutions on that level have, have done some positive things some negative things but ultimately they're a part of us and I don't want to see it stripped out for the fear of, you know, or at the exploitation, exploitation of a church building and the sin way, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, I'm not willing to do that either. And that's been a big struggle with the church, but we're really focused in on making sure that, uh, that, that the history of what, the, what is the Millville, those two buildings in particular is, are not tarnished by just cheap ploy, you know, so. Well, I, I think that's awesome too, because even, 
if you're not a religious person, you need to at least, as you said, respect the history, but also the architecture and the artwork that it's went a, into it's it. It's amazing. Be, yeah, because the stained glass in these old, beautiful buildings, uh, you have to, even if you don't have a, a religious background, you have, as an artist or an appreciator of the arts, you have to understand that that was someone's craft. That was something that Absolutely. somebody put their heart and soul into. And that and that building held wakes where people, you know, wept over the loss of loved ones and 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 baptisms and weddings and a lot of really personal individual experiences that 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 I feel are 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 stained in the church. They're a part of that building, and you you can't just, you know, this is the struggle with that kind of architecture. You can't just strip that out of it and say, well. You know that you know that didn't that didn't happen. It's you know I deal with people all the time that come into you know oh Saint Anne's I was baptized there or my mm -hmm. parents got married there and and we deal with it all the time. I ran know. into someone who went to school there. Yeah, the other day. Janae so. Janae who works for Opus One she she went to school in my living room. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> she sent cool. me a picture of her. She's like a little girl in my living room. You know and, yeah. and she was a, a that's five years old. Well, I think it's important to preserve those venues as well or those buildings because uh, they, they were built so acoustically sound back in those days yeah because they didn't have amplification they didn't yeah. have they didn't have you know pas so when when the parishioner had his 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 thing you know he needed everyone to hear exactly and i look there's a church in east liberty and i can't remember the name of it right now and i, I toured it you, you didn't hear that police but <laughs> i toured the building <laughs> and uh, it's an abandoned church, and it, it was in shambles, and it was like so depressing to see the floor was literally falling apart. You couldn't walk far into it because it was crumbling at, at your feet, and yeah. it was just vandalized. And, and the struggle with that is the amount else. of money it takes to 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 get that type of architecture back into position to where it's even viable for a business to use that shell. Once it gets past a certain point, is 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 this is past so that difficult. point? Yeah, so yeah. difficult. So a lot of times those business buildings are just demoed. And you know, at St. Anne's was on on a track, not necessarily to be demoed, but it was definitely a, a, a dilapidated piece of property when we got in there. The the original small, the smallest property, the the funhouse property. So we had to do a lot of you know, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. there's a lot, there's a lot we got to do. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know if you know, I don't think I did it. You know, I don't think I knew what I was getting into. That's one. Any of you guys out there that are like, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do this. And you buy a building for a production studio or for a recording studio, you know, just be prepared for a lot of work. I don't think it's negative that you do it. I think it's the greatest thing ever, but you should be realistic about it. It's going to, it's, it's going to kill you. Yeah. Most people don't <laughs> move into a space like this where I had to put in literally no soundproofing and I have some of the best audio quality. No, it sounds great. Yeah. I, we lucked out here. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. Oh, I no, look no. forward to seeing you at the fun house, seeing you at the theater and uh, always a uh, best of luck to you and uh, happy to be sharing the same community and and hopefully growing together well we're gonna, we're happy to be here this is awesome what you're doing and uh i know the pittsburgh music scene really appreciates the support and and what you're doing for all the musicians means a lot uh, they need they need grassroots support because that's the only support that turns into real exactly i yeah we love doing it it's it's honestly it's been I never planned to, to create a 24-hour station. It was supposed to be a podcast, and I was interviewing local musicians as part of the podcast, and I planned on outsourcing it to different radio stations. I, I met my business partners. They wanted to, to form a station. I had the technology, some connections, and I never imagined that we would be here at 24 hours. So I, it, it's crazy how life uh, takes you in different directions. It's, it's a beautiful thing if you if you just follow your intuition and work hard. The results are fascinating. Absolutely. Looking forward to seeing you. I'll be there Monday, as always. And uh, up next, we have Mike McMullen with your political update here on The River's Edge. Welcome back to The River's Edge Radio Network. Brian Crawford. And uh, <coughs> we have <coughs> Mike McMullen over the phone with your uh, political <coughs> recap. Sorry, Mike. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a little dehydrated. Not a good thing. Lots of water. <laughs> Lots of water. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, you know, dehydrated. Of course, no no pneumonia or anything, but just a little dehydration. That's good. <laughs> well, Brian, you know it's uh it's very very fluid. Um, with uh, gosh, I mean the the first debate coming up in the next week to ten days. 
Um, it, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I mean, it, it's you know, I just saw the poll this morning, in Virginia, that uh, Trump and Hillary are tied in Virginia, which you know, which is a key battleground state. Seven to ten states are going to determine the election, and this is no order going north south. New Hampshire, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, uh, in the Midwest, you've got Iowa, maybe Wisconsin, um, and you got to go to the Southwest and the West. You got Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico. Those are the really oh, and, and, and I'm sorry, uh, and Ohio, obviously, uh, in, in the Midwest, uh, our, our next door neighbor from from the Commonwealth. Mm-hmm. Boy, those seven ten states are going to are going to flip it. Um, you know, hey, the polls in PA. I mean, depending which one you see, Hillary is. St- Hillary's still up, um, you know. Gary Johnson, you know, after his, uh, you know, where's Aleppo, not Aleppo Township, up on Route 65, um, you know, that really hurt him. But at the end of the day, uh, it, it's going to be a very fluid, dynamic race, and and with Hillary having pneumonia and so forth, I mean, it, it, you know, I'm not even going to bring into, <laughs> you know, you know, I'm not even going to bring into her pneumonia situation or. Oh, she, you know, she, you know, you know, she has like, I've heard so much, so much stuff on Drudge Report and so forth. Oh, she has like two or three stunt doubles when she's making appearances. Yeah, and, uh, I've heard that. <laughs> look, you know, look, that's a bunch, that's a bunch, that's a bunch of hogwash. And ultimately, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it's just, we, we got to, let's focus on the issues. I hope they focus on the issues and not the debate and not like get into a pissing contest. Oh, well, this, let's focus on, on the, on the issues at hand. And let's see who who moves forward, and we we'll go from there. The the health condition there that is an an issue. I, I mean, you can't well, brush that aside. No, no, no. If she, you know, unfortunately, you know, you don't you don't ever want to see anyone pass away. But if she would pass away in office, then the vice president comes into play, and maybe maybe this is the first Didn't time you? in in a long time where the vice president really mattered on a ticket. Well, good point, Brian. But look, at the end of the day, look, I mean, when it comes to the president and the VP, I mean, if they weren't qual- if they weren't running for office, I mean, if they were sick or whatever, I mean, look, I mean, you know, let's do a little history, go back in time, look at FDR. I mean, you know, there's been a yeah. lot of ill presidents. Uh, well, how can I say the word? Ill with 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 many conditions and so forth. I mean, granted, the the medicine, modern day medicine, is a much different than it was at the turn of the century, you know, back in the twenties and thirties. But but look, people were saying Ronald Reagan was too old, and, and well, you know what? He was two terms, and he uh, moved he moved around pretty well. Um, so uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, you know, do, you know, do we know do we know all the issues? No, we don't. Um, but look, let's let's focus on the issues. And you know, and and look, people, look, we're not voting for a VP. <laughs> we never have. We never will. Um, you know, when when Dan Quayle was on the on the on the ticket for for Bush Senior, people vote didn't vote for Dan Quayle because he was the junior senator from from the state of Indiana. Uh, you know, people aren't going to vote for Mike Pence because he's from Indiana. People aren't going to vote for for Tim Kaine from he's from Virginia. I mean, yeah, does it help balance the ticket a little bit? Yeah, but well, let's see, balance the ticket. Let's you know did. Sarah Palin really balanced the ticket for John McCain. Did you know? Uh, did did uh, did uh, Governor uh, not Governor Ryan Speaker Ryan balance the ticket in Wisconsin? No, we didn't. Even, we didn't even win Wisconsin in twenty in twenty twelve. So you know, it's a moot point. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. One, one thing that's kind of I guess got me down, Mike, is obviously. Uh, you know, I, I have feelings on, on Hillary Clinton as far as her being president, but I, I never cheer for someone to be sick or unwell. Oh, no. And so many people are. People are just running to Facebook gleefully. Woo! She's sick! She's sick! Ramming it down people's throats. Uh, the conservative talk radio people are having a field day talking about her well, illness. Brian, great points. And, and and it's like, look, I don't... I don't wish sickness or death on anyone. You know, it's like sort of like, and I want to use the analogy or use the example, is like, look, when you're running for office, you, well, how can I say this? When you're running for office, you don't attack the family or the significant other and or the children. However, in Hillary's case this time, which is, there's always exceptions to the rule. I mean, look, if I'm running for office against Brian Crawford for, Congress, 
don't attack my family. You know, I mean, you want to attack me on, on issues and substance and this and so forth. Great. Leave the family out of it. The kids, the family, you know, the mother-in-law, whatever. Mm-hmm. However, this time around, because Hillary and Clinton, because bumbling bill, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going to be a little negative this morning. You know, when you have the former president of the United States could be the first man, <laughs> A little, little pun intended in the White House. I mean, you know that you know you you can attack there because the the there's issues. You know the the Clinton Foundation. I mean, you know that, I mean that that that's rare. I mean, how many husband and wives it could be could be potentially president, vice president. But what families are off the table, sickness is off the table. I mean, you know, just people people Amer- the American people, the American public don't want to talk about oh well, Hillary's she fainted. Look. Stick to the damn issues, jobs, taxes, economy, and 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 you know, and, and, and move forward. All right, Mike. Thank you very much. Looking forward to next week. We're actually running out of time on today's show. We're uh, we're running crazy. Anything else that's uh, that needs to be put out there? Uh, no, nope, Brian. Hey, have a good weekend, and they save the best for last. So. Absolutely, uh, that's always a good point. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Looking forward to next Thanks. week. It's Mike McMullen. Have a good weekend. Bye, bye. Our political commentator here on the River's Edge. We got our holiday of the day. All right, so today's holiday, let's see here. The holiday of the day today is National Thank You Day. So, uh, wait, that says yesterday was, was was Thank You Day. Okay, well, anyways, thank you for showing up. The most intelligent audience in radio here at the Rivers Edge PGH.com. I'm a day late on that one. Today is actually Wrinkled Raincoat Day. So, don't celebrate Wrinkled Raincoat Day because it's Millville days and we need it to be sunny and nice and wonderful out. So, don't celebrate that. Is there another another good holiday? Is there a good holiday? Oh, National Guacamole Day. Yes, that is a good holiday. National Guacamole Day. Go out to Chipotle, which apparently they're using drones now, or Cadoba, or any of the wonderful local Mexican places we have here in Pittsburgh. I know we have that one. Oh, what's it, what's it called? The one in the Strip District. Oh, they, they have like a... A, it's like a true, it's not a food truck, it's like a food cart, and they park it out, out the front of their uh, building, and the food is unbelievable that comes from that. So uh, go check them out down in the Strip District. All gets us, all tons of good stuff right there. Don't forget, you can follow us on Patreon and become part of the local music scene here in Pittsburgh. Go to riversedgepgh.com and click the Patreon link. And you can become part of the local music scene. You become our patron right here on the River's Edge. Today is episode 98. That's right. We have one more this Saturday with Jay Cooper and Howie D. Mack. And then I will take over Needs Hotel, 10 a.m., Monday morning. I'll have uh, Joanna Lowe. She's a wonderful spoken word poet. She'll be in. We're going to have Slim Forsyth, the man, the myth, the legend. He will be there as well. We'll have the the roof. They're going to be performing some songs in between as well what is today today uh, yeah tune in tomorrow tomorrow is saturday we've got jay and howie tomorrow and then again monday sunday we've got fishing without bait and we've got 24 hours of the best music in pittsburgh the best music on the radio traditional or non-traditional right here rivers edge pgh.com thank you to mike speranzo thank you to mike mcmullen and thank you for you thank you to you for listening and again for showing up at the Millville Borough Council meeting. That's it for me. I am out of time. I'm going to go take a nap. As you know, overnight. Been up since, ooh, what was it? Like 3 or so? 3 p.m. yesterday? So I need a nap. I'm taking one. I'll see you at Millville May Days tonight at Millville right here on Grand Chain. I'm Brad Crawford. I'll catch you on, uh, I'll catch you tomorrow morning.